Okay, well, so I'm going to just go ahead and get started. So welcome to uh, Supporting Innovation Through Contribution. Uh, this is uh, a, a talk for uh, people who either, yes? It is recording. We're all, a minute to start. Okay, so I am not going to start yet, but welcome to the session. Okay. Yes. Did we get some confusion? Yeah, that's a different company, uh, and uh, it, and and we were around first. We had the name first, and uh, and yeah. So so we're the Palantir that makes open source websites and. They're a Silicon Valley startup that does other things, and uh, yeah, but um, yeah, we, we, we do occasionally uh, get emails for them. They occasionally get emails for us, and we're usually able to sort it out and make sure that uh, people don't get too mixed up. But uh, yes, so you said we get some very interesting emails. I'll just say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Excellent. We're good to go. Good to go. Okay. Excellent. All right. Excellent. I will get started then. Thank you very much. So, welcome to supporting innovation through contribution. Uh, my name is George Demet. Uh, Many of you uh, know me as the uh, founder and along with Tiffany, uh, CEO of Palantir.net. We're a full service uh, web agency based in Chicago. Uh, we do a lot of work with Drupal and other open source technologies. Um, I'm also the chair of the Drupal Community Working Group, which works to help make the Drupal community a more welcoming place and help resolve conflicts between community members. Um, I've helped organize numerous Drupal events, uh, including DrupalCon Chicago, and I'm an advisor to the Drupal Association. And so this talk, um, you know, for, uh, for folks who are coming in, this is uh, a talk about innovation and contribution. Um, you know, if you are either uh, involved with running a Drupal business, or if you work at a Drupal business, or if you're somebody who's looking to get a career with a Drupal business, um, my hope is that uh, this talk will be relevant to you. So I want to start off today by talking about some, how some of the world's tallest buildings and how they've been built. Uh, much as the way that we've approached construction uh, and how it's changed over time, so is the way that we approach building websites. So for most of recorded human history, our largest structures were built simply by piling huge stones on top of each other, right? So the Great Pyramid of Giza was built by thousands of laborers over a period of 10 to 20 years and completed around 2560 BC. Uh, for nearly 4,000 years, it was the largest structure in the world at about 481 feet tall. And if you think about it, this is really kind of how we built websites uh, back in the days before content management systems became widespread. I started working with the web in 1994, and you know, for about the first five or six years, this was what you had to do. Uh, you, there was a vision of what the end product needed to look like, uh, and we just keep piling on more code and more markup until it was done. Uh, it was usually a very labor-intensive process, took a long time to complete, and you didn't have a lot of flexibility with the end product, but, you know, got the job done. So the Great Pyramid was surpassed in height only in the 14th century AD uh, by the Lincoln Cathedral in the United Kingdom's East Midlands. Uh, so at 525 feet tall, it was repeatedly the tallest building in the world from about the year 1300 until its central spire collapsed in 1549 and wasn't rebuilt. So if you imagine this Lincoln Cathedral, there was a center spire that was even taller than those two on the ends. So cathedral construction in the Middle Ages was a community-funded and supported effort, uh, frequently taking decades or even centuries to complete. When building a cathedral, the general approach was to get something fully functional up first, right? Usually the chancel, which is where the high altar sits, where the choir sings. Uh, 
And then once this minimum viable product had been completed, you could then extend outward as time and money allowed, uh, all the while maintaining a working place of worship. Uh, because these buildings were built in stages over long periods of time, they could also evolve during construction, and there was a fair amount of architectural experimentation that occurred as a result. And in a very basic sense, this is what building a website with a content management system can get you. You can get a basic site up and running fairly quickly, uh, and then you can build on top of it and innovate over time without having to take it down or start over from scratch. Uh, like the cathedrals of the Middle Ages, uh, open source content management systems like Drupal, WordPress, and Joomla are community projects that are supported and maintained by a wide variety of agencies, paid developers, and volunteers. So this is the Washington Monument, uh, which was completed in 1884. Uh, it is the world's tallest stone structure even today, and it's about 555 feet tall. Now, it's, it's very tall and very impressive, uh, but like the pyramids and the cathedrals and the other monuments that came before it, the Washington Monument is not really functional in nature, it's ornamental. Uh, despite the tremendous diversity of shapes and sizes, the kinds of tall buildings that were constructed up until the late 19th century were designed as places of worship or as monuments to kings, emperors, and presidents, not the kinds of places that you could live or work in every day. So although they were very tall, the, the actual usable amount of space you had was primarily clustered toward the bottom of the building in the case of a cathedral, and that the rest was structural and ornamental. So, this is also the limitation of many websites that are designed as completely bespoke solutions, right? They're great expressions of the business needs that existed at the time and the place in which they were built, but they all too often aren't able to adapt as those needs change over time. So in 1884, the same year that the Washington Monument was uh, completed, an architect named William LeBaron Jenny uh, pioneered what was called the Chicago Skeleton Method, where buildings were built using a load-bearing structural steel, steel frame that supported the entire weight of the walls instead of load-bearing walls that carried the weight of the building. So for the first time, it was possible to have a tall building that with usable space all the way up to the top floor. Uh, so steel replaced stone architecturally and the age of the skyscraper began. And the pinnacle of the skyscraper age was reached in 1931 with the construction of the Empire State Building in New York City. It's 1,250 feet tall. Uh, now these skyscrapers were a huge leap forward, but they were ultimately limited by the cost of building them and the inflexibility of the skeleton method. You could pretty much just build a single tower straight up. So the Empire State Building actually remained the tallest building in the world uh, for about 40 years. Uh, you know, and I'd like to think this is kind of the point that we reached with Drupal 7, right? Uh, well, the raw size and the functionality of the sites that we could build increased greatly. We also hit the limits of Drupal's cost effectiveness, technical overhead, and flexibility. So the next great innovation in skyscraper building occurred in uh, 1969 when uh, the architecture firm uh, Skidmore, Owings & Merrill, or SOM, uh, were hired to design a building with three million square feet of office space for thousands of Chicago-based employees of the Sears Corporation. So to meet the challenge, uh, SOM's architect, uh, Br architect Bruce Graham and engineer Fazer Khan developed an approach that combined individual tubes, each of which was essentially an independent building clustered in a three-by-three three matrix. So this is the uh, Sears Tower which was completed in 1974 and reached a height of 1,729 feet. And if you take a look or if you've been in this building, you can see it's really several different kind of clusters stuck, of, of stuck together. Now, the advantages of this bundled tube architectural structural system is that it provides great economic efficiency. Uh, it requires less steel and it offers greater flexibilities for buildings to take on more shapes. Uh, the structural innovations uh, introduced by the Sears Tower 40 years ago brought about a renaissance in skyscraper construction that continues to this day. 
And I believe that this kind of renaissance is also what Drupal 8 offers with its object-oriented approach, configuration management, improved APIs, and native web services support. Drupal 8's more modular architecture makes it much easier to create headless or decoupled sites that play nicely with a wide variety of frameworks and web-enabled services. And when you have this kind of flexibili flexibility, all sorts of things become possible. Uh, so this is the uh, Burj Khalifa in Dubai, which is not just the tallest skyscraper in the world today, it's also the tallest structure uh, ever built by mankind. It uh, has 163 floors and is uh, 2,722 feet, or uh, for those who do the metric system, 829 meters. Uh, so Drupal answers the call for skyscraper websites. Uh, Drupal today can and does support some of the largest, the most trafficked, and the most complex sites on the planet. And with Drupal 8, we're better equipped than ever to meet the ever-changing needs of the web. So, as we've discussed, Drupal has a long and rich history of supporting and sparking innovation. Uh, and as I've said, Drupal 8 in particular represents a fundamental shift in thinking about how websites and other digital experiences are built. Drupal 8 is able to connect people, technology, and information in ways that have never been possible before. But this innovation is only possible because of another thing that I want to talk about today, and that's contribution. So companies, agencies, and organizations that contribute to the Drupal project and community play a key role in supporting and sustaining this culture of innovation. Uh, contribution can take on many different forms. Uh, setting aside time for employees to contribute to the Drupal project and community. Uh, sponsoring uh, people to work exclusively on Drupal. Uh, and donating money, of course, to sponsor Drupal initiatives and events. So to better understand how and why companies contribute to Drupal, it's first important to understand what motivates them. So, first and foremost, what drives most companies is their bottom line, right? Most companies need to either make a profit, to uh, either make a profit or reach certain revenue or growth targets in order to remain in business. Uh, this is a classic form of what's called extrinsic motivation, right? It's when behavior is motivated by a desire to either gain a reward or, uh, in this case, money, uh, or to avoid an adverse outcome, i.e. going out of business. Uh, so many firms that contribute to Drupal are primarily driven by extrinsic motivators. Uh, the belief that working with the community will help them better develop their product, uh, will help provide them with increased visibility and status within the community, which in turn helps either dri drive sales and or recruit talent. Now, in contrast, most individuals who contribute to Drupal are primarily driven by intrinsic motivation rather than external rewards. Uh, they're motivated by the satisfaction of solving a hard problem or learning something that they didn't know before. And while many Drupal contributors do make money working with Drupal and are paid for their contributions back to the project, fundamentally, it's also something they enjoy doing for its own sake. So there's an ever-growing body of research into uh, open source ecosystems that's shedding light into uh, the ways that different forms of contribution influence innovation, both for those who contribute as well as for the projects that benefit from those contributions. Uh, so one of the more interesting studies that Tiffany actually mentioned in her keynote uh, comes from Jonathan Sims, who's a professor of strategy at Babson College. And uh, he spent years studying how firms in the Drupal ecosystem engage with each other and with the project to promote open innovation. Uh, so uh, last year, he uh, and a co-author published a paper in the um, Oxford Journal of Industrial and Corporate Change. It's a very dry paper. It's very academic. But I read it, so you don't have to. Uh, <laughs> Megan was asking me before, she's like, how did I miss it? I'm like, you don't have a subscription to the Oxford Journal of Industrial and Corporate Change? <laughs> uh, so 
in this, in this paper, he found that uh, while the impacts of open source contribution on company productivity are usually marginal, uh, overall contribution does help expand a firm's social ties and can also help shift strategic, pro uh, post uh, strategic posture and promote innovation. So uh, he draws a distinction between those who contribute intellectual property or code to the project um, and those who contribute help or other types of community support to the project. And, while, and he found that while a contributing code is associated with stronger social ties and more incremental innovations, providing help or support is associated with a more conservative strategic posture, but more radical innovation. And so what this means is that firms that primarily contribute code to projects like Drupal are more likely to be building on top of uh, work that someone else has done or collaborating with someone else to solve a shared problem. Uh, providing help, on the other hand, is much more context dependent and is more likely to lead to new questions and possible new insights, which in turn provides more opportunities for radical innovation within a particular domain. Now, regardless of what form contribution takes, participating in an open source ecosystem like Drupal requires that firms be open and willing to share their knowledge and intellectual property with others. Uh, so, so Dries has actually blogged about how companies and organizations like Pfizer and Hubert Berta Media are not only sharing Drupal contributions with their competitors, but they're also challenging those competitors to contribute back as well. And he argues that by working together, these organizations not only gain a competitive edge, but they also reap the benefits of accelerated innovation, saying, those that contribute to open source are engaging in a virtuous cycle that benefits their own projects. It's a tide that raises all boats, a model that allows progress to accelerate due to wider exposure and public input. So we've actually seen this virtuous cycle play out firsthand uh, at my company, Palantir.net. Uh, so several years ago, we found that on many of the projects that we worked on, clients had often had a very specific set of expectations around content workflow and editorial access based on their experience with other platforms and that all too often Drupal didn't meet those expectations out of the box. Uh, in response to this business need, uh, we created and released a series of modules called Workbench that provided a unified interface that enabled authors and editors to focus on managing their content instead of learning how to use Drupal. So this is actually a photo of a bunch of us from Palantir getting together at a hotel room, uh, DrupalCon San Francisco in 2010, where we started hashing out the first ideas that led to Workbench over what appears to be a lot of beer. <laughs> and uh, now while, while Palantir team members did the initial heavy lifting on the code development for Workbench, over time, other firms, including many of our competitors, started using and extending the system, building on top of what we had released. And eventually, thanks to the efforts of those involved in the Drupal workflow initiative, uh, the moderation component of Workbench was added to Core in Drupal 8, making the software better for everyone. Uh, this, in turn, makes Drupal a more attractive choice than competing platforms and expands the market for the firms that work with it. Now, as we talked about earlier, right, individuals are more likely to be driven by intrinsic motivators to contribute to open source projects. In addition to the personal satisfaction that they might receive, participating in the Drupal community also enables them to feel like they're, they're something, part of something much bigger than themselves. And they can form social ties with other people who also want to see their contributions make a difference in the world. This obviously is DrupalCon New Orleans. <laughs> so a, one problem is that despite the large number of individual contributors to the Drupal project, there's only a very small number who do the majority of the work from a code contribution perspective. 
So um, you probably, if you've been to sessions like this before, seen charts uh, that, that uh, talk about the long tail of contribution. This is one that I generated uh, this spring representing the total number of people who've contributed to Drupal 8 core uh, as of, I think, April 1st of this year. So there were almost 4,000 people overall who were uh, responsible for uh, various core commits. The vast majority were done only by a couple hundred people. And, and in fact, there was one person alone, who you can't even really see on this chart, who was responsible for almost 2,000 commits. Uh, so yeah, this is the classic long tail of contribution. And so when you know, people show charts like this, they're like, oh, well, what about contrib? Maybe, maybe, maybe it looks a little bit better with contrib, right? Um, but, but actually, when you factor that in, it, the picture doesn't change that much. And so um, Dries and uh, Matthew Tift did a study last year on uh, contribution data on Drupal.org. Uh, and they found that, last year, and they found that approximately 51% of the contributors involved got just one credit, uh, while the top 30 contributors, or to put that in perspective, that's the top one half of 1% of all contributors accounted for over 21% of the total credits. So that is a lot of work being done by a very small number of people. So one likely reason for this imbalance is Drupal's reputation for having a very steep learning curve. Right? So uh, back in 2014, uh, the Drupal Association um, hired uh, Whitney Hess to do some uh, user research for Drupal.org. And, um, and, and the results of that work were that uh, while the project is really good at onboarding people at the entry level of engagement, the newcomer level, the newbie level, the transition to higher levels is much more challenging. It's where a lot of people end up dropping out of the project. I've had some conversations with folks about this here at this camp. So providing resources and support to help more people move up the contribution ladder helps spread the burden across more shoulders and thus flattens out the pyramid. So, and again, introducing new perspectives and reducing burnout, particularly within the core developer community. Um, you know, as part of a uh, work with the community working group, we interviewed a whole lot of people, uh, you know, last year, to kind of do a little bit of a of a mini retrospective on their experiences with with Drupal 8. And we heard this a lot that there was a lot of pressure on a very small number of people, and a lot of people experienced burnout. That's something we can mitigate if we can expand the number of people who are able to work at that level. Having more engaged community members also helps mitigate one of the historical hurdles to Drupal adoption, which is the sh shortage of skilled developer talent. In order to get there, though, we need to remove artificial barriers to contribution, whether real or perceived, because those barriers undermine the, both the intrinsic motivations of individual contributors and the extrinsic motivations of companies, agencies, and other organizations. So one important barrier that's actually been fairly recently removed is the project application process, right? Uh, which meant uh, previously it would, could take up to six months or a year for new modules to get published on Drupal.org. Uh, now anyone who has an account on Drupal.org can create new projects without waiting and then opt in to security advisory coverage. I think there's still some work to do on this, but it's a very important step toward encouraging contribution. There's also a lot of active work being done within the community to continue to streamline our development workflow and to make it even easier for more people and more firms to contribute. Um, over the last few years, the Drupal Association and others have also worked to help track and acknowledge more forms of contribution on Drupal.org. Uh, they're making improvements to the user and organizational profile pages, adding the ability for organizations to receive credit for work on projects and issues, and tying case studies directly to organizations as well as to individual contributors. 
So along with paid sponsorships, these improvements enable companies and organizations who contribute to the project and community to receive much greater visibility on Drupal.org, which benefits both sales and recruiting efforts. And now the, 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 the cautionary side of this is while external recognition is an important source of validation for many individuals, open source projects need to be careful not to place too much emphasis on extrinsic motivators as that can actually undermine intrinsic motivation. In this way, recognizing different forms of contribution is a very delicate balancing act. So we've been talking a lot about uh, code contribution, but there are lots of other forms of contribution, such as local event and user group uh, organization. There's writing documentation, providing mentorship. These things, these forms of contribution are much less easy to measure, but they're also critically important to the health of the project. So um, David Rosas, uh, he's a Drupal developer and a PhD student at the University of Surrey, presented a paper at DrupalCon Barcelona in 2015, uh, where he argued that these kinds of community-oriented contributions are actually more important to a project's long-term sustainability than code contributions because they're emotional experiences that help serve to strengthen the project's sense of community. So it also means that firms that are not in a position to contribute code to Drupal can contribute time and or money toward efforts that help promote the project and community. Uh, so for example, I mean, you know, Palantir is a firm, we're very involved in the Drupal community. We, we're, we're in a position where we have people who are able to contribute code both you know, as part of their paid professional development, um, but who also just do it in their, in their off time as well. There are other firms that have you know, much higher billable utilization rates where people are expected to work a much higher percentage of their time on projects, which means that they don't have that freedom, they don't have that flexibility to contribute code. However, those kinds of firms can usually contribute money. And, um, and they can you know, contribute toward helping sponsor uh, local or regional events, like Drupal camps, like what we're at, uh, or Drupal Association partnership programs, which Megan would really love for more folks to do. Uh, and, and, and these kinds of contributions and can actually have a greater impact on innovation than just code alone. So we've been thinking a lot about like, these sort of issues and I've been talking about with the other members of, uh, of the community working group and how we can really uh, try to, to help reduce some of these barriers to contribution in the community, how we can get more people involved and engaged. And two areas where we actually see a huge potential, particularly for firms to contribute uh, to promote innovation in the Drupal ecosystem, is by supporting community leadership training and mentorship programs. So because we've kind of historically looked at ourselves as a meritocracy, a lot of people have ended up in positions of responsibility in the Drupal community based on their ability to write good code. But that's often not enough, right? People who find themselves in positions of leadership or responsibility without sufficient uh, training or preparation or support from others often flounder. They can end up feeling overwhelmed or isolated because they actually don't have the skills to work with or to motivate other people. Now, the good news is that we do have some of those folks who do know uh, how to do that, and also that many of these skills can be taught. Uh, that was a lot of what Tiffany was talking about in Keenan. All of these skills can be taught, even basketball, apparently. <laughs> so. What we need to do is we need to uh, help emerging leaders in our community develop skills like creative problem solving, conflict resolution, and consensus building so that they in turn can help others be successful. Now, one of the things we've been doing as we've been working through some of these issues in the community working group is talking with other projects to see how they tackle these kinds of uh, problems. 
Uh, and, and there's actually been some really great work done by Mozilla on developing a curriculum for community leadership training in an open source community context. And I'd really like to see Drupal be able to leverage some of that work. Uh, and if we can find a way to subsidize that training, this is also an opportunity for us to help enable talented people who might not otherwise have be able to afford to rise into leadership positions in our community instead of just relying on those who have the time and the resources. So this is a good way to get more different kinds of people into our community. We also need to focus our mentorship efforts, not just on onboarding newcomers, people at that bottom level of the pyramid, but also helping them move up the skills pyramid. In an ideal world, we'd be able to provide mentors with the training and support that they need to pair up with high potential contributors for long-term one-on-one mentorships and offer more non-code mentoring opportunities for things like running community events. So, so like imagine if Drupal Camp organizing teams uh, were able to get help from paid interns who would gain skills and experience that they could then in turn take back to help organize well-run events in their own local communities. I mean, that, that's good for everyone. So at Palantir, we've spent the last few years uh, focusing on growing talent instead of just hiring talent. Uh, many of the developers who we've hired over the last few years have come out of our paid internship program, where we have college-age people who work alongside other team members on real projects for real clients. Um, this program has not just helped uh, new hires gain knowledge and experience, but it has also helped some of the people who have been on our team for a long time learn and develop new skills while training others. Uh, it also means that we're able to hire from a more diverse pool of talent than we would have been able to otherwise. So, in the end, I believe that what has enabled Drupal to become a leading platform for digital innovation is not just the fact that it has one of the largest and most diverse communities of any open source project on the planet, but it also has a culture that supports and values contribution. But in order to keep that virtuous cycle going, it's vital for companies, organizations, and individuals that use Drupal to keep encouraging a culture of contribution. So, thank you. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Yes? Yes. Extrinsic, extrinsic. So uh, e extrinsic is, is like um, you do something and somebody gives you a reward for doing it, right? And, uh, and then intrinsic is I'm doing this because I want to, right? I'm motivated to do it, I'm passionate about it. And, and it's that intrinsic motivation that drives people to be part of our project, that passion. They, like, they want to be part of this, this project. They want to they wanna solve problems. They want to learn new things. And that is incredibly valuable. Um, so that's what drives individual people, right? And, and there's a lot of firms and agencies that, that have that as part of their culture because they're made up of people who have this intrinsic motivation. But at the end of the day, the firms also need to be able to make money. They need to also have, you know, uh, if they're going to spend time and energy and money and resources, they need to get something back for that, right? They need to get in something tangible like, you know, uh, new clients or, you know, being able to hire people. Uh, and so that's, that's, so my, what I'm arguing is that the extrinsic motivators are what drive companies and agencies, and it's intrinsic motivation that drives individual people. Does that answer your question? Okay. Anyone else? And, and I think you're right that, that putting an emphasis on, on, on how many, that you said that we are, as a project, it's, Drupal is beginning to give more visibility to extrinsic motivation. Yes.
you, you can associate it with your company, right? Or with your, uh, or your profile, exactly. Right, and it's something. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and it's one of the things I think, you know, for us, you know, just speaking from our own experience, like, you know, as a person, I love, you know, to be able to say, yay, I did this thing, and, and to have that show up on my profile. But as, as the owner of an agency, you know, being able to be on that marketplace page and being able to see my, my position on that marketplace rise as we add a new case study or, you know, we have people make some new code contributions or whatever. That's also really valuable as well because we get a ton of leads from Drupal.org and the, high, the more visibility we have on Drupal.org, the better it is for our business, right? So, so that's, that's you know, part of the thing. You know, and so the rewards are really good for, for a company. As a person, it, it's nice to be noticed, but like, I'm gonna do this anyway, right? Because I'm driven to. Tiffany. I'm challenge, that. challenge, sure. I think that, that there are individual extrinsic motivators that have always been yes. at play. I mean, if you think about our karma system, the yes. karma Yeah. Yes. You want to be. You want to be. It's 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 recognition and it's validation, as I said earlier. So so I've actually had this conversation with with Angie Byron with WebCheck because there was we were talking a few years ago about whether whether we should. I mean, we have kind of an informal karma system right now, which is where. You know, if you're around and you make contributions and everything, like people start to kind of recognize who you are and you, you gain this sort of informal status that way, right? So one of the things we talked about is whether it made sense on Drupal.org to kind of formalize that for individual contributors that like, you know, if you made X number of contributions or whatever, you'd like gain a level, right? Like, like a role playing game or something. And she felt very strongly that that was a terrible, terrible idea because it just, if, if, if you're just doing this to level up, like, you know, to get the little, you know, candy crush or, or whatever it is, right? Like, like that saps your, that internal desire to grow and learn. So yes, I would, I would, I would say validation, recognition is, is important. But people aren't, but, it's, but it would be a mistake to, to make that something that, that people felt they needed to work for. Right. right. But I do think that there is an economy in Drupal. Yes. Yeah. So so yeah, let's get some other hands up. Yeah. Yeah. Joining that to free knowledge. 
Oh my. It's a nice idea. You just gave us a lecture. Yeah. So our compromise is to give that our back yeah. to our organization. Right. You can do it like cleaning the, the place or giving more lectures or stuff. But the, there is this, this covenant right. where, where I co commit to give it back. Pay it, pay it forward. Yes? Pay it forward? Yeah. That, so that's, there's a, um, there was, there, there, it, was a, it was a book a few years back and a movie and everything. And so the idea is if, 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 someone, if, someone, if someone does a good deed for you, then you turn around and do a good deed for someone else, right? And if we can mix that yeah. communication in a site, something that is very big, because I think in the early training of Drupal, like the people that doesn't know to use a computer, and, and it, it works. And the thing is that the people who know is often too busy to deal with the people who don't. Right. So all the newcomers, usually they only have this stack overflow answers, and most of them are playing wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the worst case is when they're almost right, because those, those are going to cost the person like a month to realize yeah. what was that difference between do and don't. So, so the problem is that we don't have these vertical relationships. Right. We have like levels. And until you really know how to read a model and understand what it's doing, you're like fine. Yeah. And there's we're losing, we're losing a lot of people and contributors, people who knows how to code, who likes Drupal, but, but they're just in the, in the sea of Right, they're not, they're not getting the support, they're not getting the recognition, they don't know like where to go or who to talk to and, and, and some sort of, in some way, I mean, and so I'm, I'm thinking about it from the mentorship side that, you know, we can, we can help provide those people with, you know, a place to go to talk to someone and be like, how, how do I get heard? Like the streams Yeah, like it's, it, it's, and that works, but that only works for people who go to camps. Yeah. Have you seen Mustard Seed Media? Have, have seen Mustard Seed? Yeah, Mustard Seed Media? The, a front yeah. a guy who is mm -hmm. a coder. Yep. He, he does something different that we do on the group of the org, that he doesn't answer a specific error. He instead answer a need, and that's mm -hmm. something group of the org doesn't have. Right. Like re recites in humans, in human language, where, where I, I can read by subject what I want to achieve with this model, because often you don't know what you want to get until you realize there's a model for that. Right. Oh, this is the I can build. Oh my God, I'll live so long with all this stuff. Yep. Even if Mike doesn't like it, it's still good. <laughs> <laughs> you had a hand, yes. Okay. Me, I do remember this. Yeah. Yeah. They had a very interesting old old times. Mm-hmm. And then came HTML5, of course, with Flash and along with alongside of the kid killed out on the Flash and neurons. It's still alive early. But anyways, they had a very interesting. Do you remember the direct systems? Yeah. Whatever you did, did something, you got a batch, and then you could change your property feature, and then it provided a very dynamic. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. I mean, so, but I'm, you know, but I'm listening. I mean, so what I'm hearing is maybe, maybe to have that option, right? To not make it a requirement, but, but for, for those people who are really driven by that sort of extrinsic recognition to have that option and that's also maybe a way we can we can we can recognize some people who who might have potential who we might not catch otherwise because they might just disappear
Yes. That's right. So, I mean, to expect people to intrinsically be motivated to too high a degree, yes, they're intrinsically motivated to have a good life, to be kind to their neighbors, to be kind to their neighbor on the computer, on the, you know, approval site, but they're also trying to get over that bar, learn what they need to learn so that they can earn money. Get a good job, all those things. Yeah. That's right. No question. And 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 so and so yes. No question. I mean, that's how I make my living. That's how a, a, probably most people in this room make their living, right? Is is through Drupal. And 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 you are able to, you know, get a better job by, you know, getting better at Drupal. Right. 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 But is the way is the way to do that by giving them a gold star for every contribution, or is the way to do that saying, "Hey, you know, we're able to recognize that you're you're someone who's smart, who has potential, who has who seems to have that passion. Let's pair you." with someone who can help you level up and get over that bar and then you're and then you can pay it forward, I right? Almost, I mean, you might know more than me about this, but I would almost say like rather than just every contribution gets your point and, and you get, you know, a color level right. based on contribution, I would almost have like maybe you won't like this idea, but like a, an exam or something. Can you can you learn these three things? Yeah. Right. Well, I think that's the I think it's the idea behind yeah certi certification that exists right <laughs> so. Yeah. But everything, right? Progressive, progressive. It builds on top of. I mean, that I would love to see, right? So, you know, so so it's it's, you know, so yeah. I mean, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. I want to start a project if I am not partner with someone who can push it. That makes because sense. If that's only me, nobody will use it. It's poverty. Right. It will have a lot of attention. Sounds like you're intrinsically motivated to do this. <laughs> so I hand back there, yeah. Yeah. Yep.
I, yeah, no, it's a great question. I mean, and, and even closer to the martial arts scene, does anyone remember Drupal Dojo from like six, seven years ago? That was, an, an, again, the similar idea. Right. The association created the curriculum. So you pay your fee, you, you, you talk to the association, they give you this is the curriculum, this is the curriculum, this is blah, 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 blah. After they do that, the testing doesn't happen, it's not centralized, it's recognized. So after that, who tests the white belt, the local black belt? Mm -hmm. Right. That was the Drupal ladder and the Drupal dojo had issues because it was centralized. I had right. to go there and do it. The idea of the project at the time was we can start talking with companies that have training, you know, like right. uh, probably not charging a fee, but this is the curriculum. There you go, we train you, you, you do leadership camp, you do uh, training camp for education. This is how you teach this part of the curriculum, this is how you teach. This is uh, how you make different types of blah, 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 learning. Blah, blah. You, you train the trainer, and then they're ready to teach the curriculum and test right. the lower level. I think that makes a lot of sense. Well, yeah. On black belts, it's not recognizing each other. Right. Yeah, I mean, and, and, you know, ultimately, ultimately the idea is, you know, one, getting some more, uh, the whole thing right now is like, it's super opaque, right? And, you know, I mean, I think about myself and it's like, what level Drupal person am I, right? Like, I can't code. I, I don't know how to code. But, but it's not just about taking a question. Right. Or it might not be just one left. It might have branches. Right. Maybe if there would be a way to formalize it and give it visibility, I think it would be useful. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. And, and uh, you know, but but really about just making it more transparent, like how one, you know, <laughs> how one learns, how one can learn, you know, and and you know, so we can recognize. Because I think you know, one of the issues we have is we don't have a great way right now to recognize and foster leadership in our community. We have people who, you know, who are leaders in our community. A lot of them have been leaders for a long time. You know, but there's no great way of like recognizing like, wow, like that person has a lot of really, it's, it's random, it's chance, it's, you know, that person is in the right place at the right time and they did, said or did the right thing and they, you know, we, need, we can change that and, and make it easier for more people to be recognized and for more people to become, you know, part of our community, to rise in our community, to become leaders in our community and you know, I think that's something we'd all like to see, right? So, I think it's lunchtime. Everyone ready? All right, thank you so much. <laughs>